observation from the beginning. We talk a lot about recovery, but I think it's also time now to really start thinking beyond that and put to the fore reflections about resilience and sustainability. This present situation of COVID and through the experiences of our ILC members, we've seen that this crisis directly originates, but also impacts on land rights. So protecting land rights is part of the mitigation processes we've entailed, part of the we've implemented towards recovery. But it's also time now to look ahead and understand and promote land rights as being the center for new opportunities to build better in the future in the medium and longer term. Land rights are foundational elements to various pillars of sustained development. They are central to more resilient local food systems. They are central to more equitable labor and youth absorbing socioeconomic models. They are central to more sustainable environmental management system and they are central to stronger local democracies. So beyond recovery, it's now time to think outside the box and to embrace land as central, to develop more resilient societies and to develop more a sustainable planet overall. And that's why my presentation will be in two parts. The first one, which I will deal with quite quickly, will be on the immediate tasks. Four actions will be presented on land rights and that focus specifically on recovery. Of course, recovery is necessary. We've seen the dire situations many of our communities live in at the moment under the lockdown, etc. So recovery remains necessary. But then quite quickly, I will go to the building back better part where I'll present eight contributions for the land rights sector to move to more resilient and more sustainable economies and societies. Just two points. All the points that I will be presenting you have been identified from the ILC members, from their actions and from their engagements in the framework of COVID-19. So it's certainly not an exhaustive list, but it's a list that comes out of what we do as a land sector and what we as the land community can bring to the world with regard to recovery, but also sustainability. Secondly, there's probably more that can be done. There's surely more that can be done. But the points I will make here are only focusing on land rights, mainly because I was asked to talk about land rights, of course, but also because we want to make a point here. And it's to say that land is central. Land is a building block if we want more resilience and more sustainability in the future, and if we want to avoid crises like COVID-19 and others, of course, in the future. So let me start quite quickly with the four immediate actions for recovery. The first one is about protect. Let's protect land rights and mediate conflicts as pressure over land increases. Pressure on land increases because you probably know better than me, We've been affected by reverse migration, mainly by returning workers, which puts commercial pressure, but also uh, use pressure on land, especially for women that are uh, disproportionately more affected. Increasing pressure is also related to increased land grabbing, in particular due to increased police societies. And lastly, increased pressure is also due to uh, weakened enforcement and accountability measures due to the, the lockdowns and the guarantee of land rights. The second one is about ensuring access to land. We've all been affected by the lockdown. All economic activities have stopped or slowed down at least. It's necessary if we do not want to affect the livelihoods of our members and of our land community and the agricultural community overall to ensure access to land so that they can maintain these socioeconomic fabrics and uh, maintain their livelihoods. Third one is to monitor and provide legal protections against land rights violations. In the context of lockdown, mostly the vulnerable populations are particularly exposed to threats, attacks, and cases of harassment, land grabbing, etc. It's particular at this time where civic space is reduced, the land community should provide monitoring and should provide these legal tools where possible. 
And then lastly, it's protect the integrity of the IPLC territories, of the indigenous peoples and local community territories. Their capacities are in general already reduced. They have been the most affected by the crisis. And the capacity for emergency services to respond to their needs has also been reduced to the lockdown. Special attention to the protection and the integrity of the IPLC territories that is called for here. That brings me to the building back better, to the core of my presentation here. Eight actions have been identified through the activities of our community. The current crisis has reaffirmed that the need to engage in more sustainable development paths. We have to look ahead. Land rights could be at the center of such paths, representing opportunities to building back better. Land rights are core to building resilience to crisis and are fundamental stepping stones towards more sustainable development and a more sustainable world of rule. But to engage in such paths, the land community should embrace the opportunities for systems change out of the crisis towards a more sustainable future. So there's a risk that we don't take or don't, that we don't learn lessons from what is going on here and that we just implement short-term actions for recovery. We should, out of this risk, make them opportunities and start thinking out of the box and using these as opportunities for a real system change with regarding land, but also with regarding all the activities related to land, including agriculture. Eight actions we would like to bring to the fore. And they related, of course, to the immediate actions, but go beyond that. First of all, land rise for localized, resilient, and sustainable economic food systems. It's not only necessary to protect farms from losing their lands. They are also fundamental to maintaining social fabric, economic activities, employment creation, particularly with regards to food systems and agriculture. Protecting the land rights for these very localized activities is necessary in the long term. Secondly, land rights for equality and equal economic opportunities. Redistribution and secure land rights for the poorest represent a basis for alternatives to the expansion of large-scale agriculture investment. Alternatives to patterns of concentration, alternatives to exclusion and marginalization. They are strategic stepping stones towards more inclusive development processes as they rebalance as well power relations within the land sector, within agriculture, within our economies. Thirdly, strengthening equitable, inclusive and democratic governance. The two first points will not be possible if there's no transparency in the land sector, if there's no transparency in decision-making processes regarding land. These processes should be transparent, should be open to all members of society. Strengthening multi-stakeholder processes, placing all decisions on land is necessary to build such open and evidence-based decision-making processes. Fourthly, decentralized management for healthy landscapes and ecosystems. Healthy landscapes and ecosystems are best achieved through empowered community participating in decision-making and management at a territorial level with the authorities, of course, but with means and incentives to manage their lands and natural resources during times of crisis and way beyond. The driving force behind territorial multi-stakeholder decision-making processes is equitable access to decision-making spheres, but also to the distribution of the benefits allowing for socioeconomic development. Fifthly, position land rights to mitigate migration within the urban-rural nexus. The links between rural and urban have become much more evident lately. It's not about rural or urban anymore. It is rural and urban. And it's now necessary to recognize and support the multifunctional nature of land. This represents the need to rethink the alternatives for development in an intersectoral way based on the dynamics of living territories with diverse identities and needs, whether they're rural and urban, and not rural or urban. Sixthly, indigenous people's territorial rights for resilient systems. I've said it already in the immediate actions as they are so important. But recognizing their rights and territorial rights is not only defending their land rights, it's also recognizing the stewardship role that the 
indigenous peoples play with regards to climate change, global biodiversity, biocultural conservation, and the justice and sustainable livelihoods. I don't think number seven needs to be said anymore, but it has to be emphasized every time. Women's land rights for gender justice. As I said, women are disproportionately affected by such crises, whether it's COVID or the longer crisis like climate change, etc. Protecting their rights is certainly still more than necessary. And last point, democratizing land data for future crisis preparedness and inclusive evidence-based decision making. If you want it to be more transparent, we need to make it more evidence-based. Unbiased land information capturing the multi-dimension of land, the multi-sexual nature of land is necessary to feed these processes. Regarding that, there's a need for promotion and recognition of non-traditional and open land databases alongside their acceptance and integration into the official data systems. Being parallel data systems is not sufficient. They have to be integrated in the official system. I'll just conclude. So I think you've understood well. I made my point. Land rights are very central to the recovery, but also to resilience and more sustainable development paths. To promote that, we need to think generally, rethink generally our future by being innovative, by putting land in the central into a broader framework. It's not only about land for land rights, it's about land for climate change, land for resilience, land for sustainable development, land for gender, etc. Keeping land rights as a priority is necessary within these broader frameworks. And I think we all here at the Asian Land Forum convinced of that, but there's still a long route to go. At the ILC Secretariat, part of the Land Momentum Group just finalized the research about the VNRs, about the voluntary national reviews. And we've seen that only in a few, actually in only one or two of all the countries that have presented the VNRs, land was part of it. So in only very few, land was mentioned. And even if it was mentioned, it was only marginally mentioned. So there's still a huge work from our land community to promote land as, as central, and to rethink the future where land is central, but land is part of these broader dynamics. Thank you very much.